Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Here we go. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm so incredibly excited. I have Sage Dyer, uh, the wonderful writer who wrote uh, Knowing 11 Lessons to Understanding the Quiet Urges of Your Soul with her sister, Serena Dyer. Um, that name may sound familiar. Sage and Serena are the daughters of the wonderful Wayne Dyer. So we have so much to talk about. Before we begin, I just recommend that everybody go out and buy this book. This is an amazing book that talks about uh, Wayne Dyer, his experience, and their relationship with their father and the lessons that they learned. And you learn so much amazing stuff about Wayne Dyer. Wayne Dyer is one of the most amazing spiritual teachers ever. I can still <laughs> hear his voice in my head. I, I think pretty much millions of people can close their eyes and instantly hear his voice and his teachings. And if you have been if you've accessed his books and writings, then it's very likely that on a daily basis, you're coming upon stuff in which um, the lessons are being learned that he has taught. So I was um, really fortunate to get a chance to talk to Sage and have her come on. Um, so thank you so much for coming on and welcome to the Reality Revolution. Yeah, thank you for that awesome introduction. And uh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. As somebody who has lost both of uh, his parents. And uh, I know that this is something that resonates and rings and, 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 and you go through so many different things when you lose your parents. And on top of all, top of it all, you, you had a, a father that taught about loss and so many things that you were going through. So uh, how, how, tell me a little bit about the journey just to start to give an introduction of of your father and losing your father and what really inspired you to write this book? Yeah, so um, when my father passed away, it was out of nowhere. It was very sudden. He wasn't sick. He was 75. He was very healthy, vibrant, young. I had just actually been with him in um, on a three-week book tour in Australia and New Zealand where he was giving you know, eight-hour lectures, three days straight, all of that. So he was so full of life. So I got home on, I think like August 27th or 8th, he passed away. I found out that he had passed away on August 30th, two days later. It was a complete shock to me and to my whole system. I mean, and if I'm being completely honest, my life up until that point had been very smooth sailing. Mm. Um, so yes, I grew up with this father who was in this world and who taught so much about spirituality, but it didn't really apply to me yet. I never felt challenged. My beliefs were not challenged because I hadn't lost anybody that I was really close to like that or gone through something that made me question my beliefs. And um, when my dad passed away, I, I felt like I was at a crossroads. You know, I had just been immersed in all of his work. And especially at the end of his life, he was talking so much about death and um, how it's just an illusion and it's something he looks forward to because it's an immersion into love. And so I had just heard him speak about all of that, but I couldn't help but wonder like, but is it, you know, or is this just the end? And I was really filled with a lot of um, fear-based thoughts of all the should haves, all the could haves, all the never agains. I was constantly finding myself like overcome with grief. And then thinking, oh, just call dad. And then, you know, it would hit me all over again. I'll never do that again. And I think these are totally normal thoughts to be having and nothing that anybody should judge themselves for if you're having those thoughts. But I got to a point where I, for me, was like, I can't continue like this anymore. Um, this isn't serving me. I'm stuck. I'm not able to feel my dad or, you know, so... I had this thought one time where I said, okay, you can't call dad anymore. You're never going to call him again. But what would he say to you if you could, you know, you have a lifetime of knowing him, what would he say to you? And I felt like I all of a sudden felt his presence around me. And I actually was hearing him tell me, you know, Sage, you have a choice right now. You could either make this the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You could put your life on hold. You could believe that I'm gone. Um, and that you'll, you know, you'll never feel my love again, all of that. Or you could choose to know that I am still with you, that all the things that I 
talked about your whole life and especially in these last three weeks that you just got to hear me because I went to all of his lectures um that all of that is true and that I'm I'm just home you know I was on earth we're in the classroom and now I've returned back home but I'm always with you and it was a, a big moment for me because at that time I started to say okay I'm going to choose to know that and it wasn't like all of a sudden everything changed, but it was, and all of the sudden I was open to believing that and feeling his presence and receiving signs from him. And I, I started to feel called to read his books and listen to his lectures. And that's when miracles started to take place for me. And, and I had a visitation through a dream and I had um, just really cool signs that comforted me so much. And I felt like I could feel my dad and the even cooler part was I felt so interested in his work all of a sudden, which, you know, prior to him um, passing away, I was interested, but I wasn't so interested, you know, mm -hmm. and so I, I started writing. I found writing to be very cathartic for me. And uh, like sometimes I would sit, I made it a goal to write a thousand words a day, five days a week. When my dad would write, he mm -hmm. said, you have to write every day, even if you don't feel um, inspired to write, you have to do it every day. I was in grad school, so I had other writing going on too. So I said, I'm gonna write about this experience five days a week, a thousand words a day. Often I would sit down to write and have no idea what I was gonna write that day. Just start one sentence, two sentences, and I would come up with things that I didn't know I knew. <laughs> you know, things would surface from memories with my dad, things I learned from him and my mom. Um, and that's what started our book the knowing and it was a long journey my, my sister was serena was also writing i didn't know that at the time at a certain point we talked about it we said well why don't we combine our work and see if we can turn it into a book together and uh we did that it took us a long time uh, for a little while we we had written the book but we stopped uh having that inspiration to get it out there and then mm -hmm. I got pregnant. I said, we have to do this now because I believed that my time to get it done was ending, even though that's not, turns out that's not true, but I, I believed it at the time. And, and that's how our book was born. Amazing. Uh, it really is wonderful because just a little bit, it, get, it brings your dad back for that one more book, you know, right. to me, it felt like I got another one. I got another, I wasn't expecting to, because it's, it, it reads like a Wayne Dyer book. He always oh, kept everything so personal. And right. uh, I just wanted to, uh, I'm sure you get these quite, I just want to get, and, and you talk about it in the book, what it's like to live with Wayne Dyer. Um, right. You know, um, you, people will see on, and on PBS that this, this man who knows so much, but he uh, was a student. He, he loved, he was constantly interested in new stuff coming out. One of always. my favorite uh, I remember reading, uh, listening to an episode. He had just listened to the impersonal life, and and he's like in his sixties, yeah. but he sounded like a little kid. That oh my god, I've just read this new thing, and right. he's so excited. And that excitement that he carried on, no matter what, all the way to the end, it was so amazing. Tell me a little more about yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. My dad never stopped learning, and it right. was from books, and it was from uh, documentaries, and all of that, and it was also just from people. He loved people. Um, you know, when I'd be out uh, with him in Maui, and we'd be for a going for a walk, he'd get stopped every time. He'd get stopped at least once. It never annoyed him. He was always happy to stop and talk to people, and he he would stand there for 10, 15, 20 minutes, sometimes longer, and you know, allow people to tell them his story. And I was always really um, in awe of that because I find myself like rushing, rushing, rushing. Okay, okay, that's cool, you know. But he, he was a busy man and he always found the time to listen to people. And he discovered so many incredible stories that way. Um, Anita Morjani, if you've heard of her. Mm -hmm. and her I interviewed book, her Dying. and she told me all about yeah. her wonderful so, experience with him, yeah. And that was just him being fascinated by somebody's story who was written, it was written online in, you know, not the best grammar, just a, a PDF put online, 30 mm -hmm. pages. And, and he read it and was so inspired and said, I have to find this woman. And it, and she ended up calling into his radio show because she knew she found out he was looking for the author of this story and the woman who had experienced this uh, miracle. 
you don't know her story, I recommend checking it out. Mm -hmm. But um, just that's just one example. I mean, there's so many people like that. So yeah, he was always uh, wanting to learn and getting excited and sending his kids books, read, you got to read this. And right. <laughs> sometimes I did. And sometimes I didn't, you know, but um, now I wish I had read all of them. <laughs> so is it a wife's tale? I, I think you might have mentioned in the book, but um, one I've heard a lot is that he walked every day and he would always find a penny or a coin or something every single time he walked. It was like a miracle. Is, is this yeah. is this true? Yes. And honestly, he kept all of them and like taped them to the cabinets and got a little weird at one point. We just had like pennies, quarters, dollars, uh, you know, but the coolest thing about it was that he would say when he picked it up, thank you universe for this symbol of abundance that is constantly flowing into my life. And um, the reason he would say that is because he said, you can't see a penny on the ground and scoff, at, scoff exactly. at it or, you know, be too good to bend over and pick it up, but then ask the universe to be a millionaire. You know, you have to appreciate, you have to be in flow with the abundance in order for it to, to flow into your life. And so I took that, but the other day I found $40 and I said, <laughs> I said my thank you to the universe. And then I said my thank you to my dad, because I live in New York city and right. Which is know. rare, but I bet right. you in New York city, he'd still find a penny in a quarter every single time. Oh, he walked, right? Yeah. <laughs> His all the eyes time. were looking right. <laughs> right. He was tapped in, you know, they're there. It's, are you tapped into that abundance is, how he taught us he taught us that you know the the uh, abundance is like the ocean it's endless and it's vast and there's enough for everybody and you mm -hmm. could go to the ocean every day and you could take out a dropper full of water or you could go to the ocean every day abundance and you could take out truckloads of water and you're never going to deplete it so exactly. what are you tapping into truckloads or dropper fills you know just enough or more than you can imagine so another interesting story I heard is that later in his life, I think after he had been sick, he gave away all of his possessions. And I didn't know if that was true or not. Did he do that? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Let me clarify, because he had clarified this, too. He had an office in Florida um, mm -hmm. for years. I mean, my whole life before I was born. So probably 20, 30 years he had this office and it was full of any award he'd ever received, um, books on books on books, manuscripts that had already, you know, just all the things he had collected right. over 30 years of being an author. And he decided to, after he moved to Hawaii, he eventually decided he didn't need that office anymore. Instead of going back and packing up all the keepsakes, he just said, let's just give it all away. So he donated the books and he had his assistant help him with that. And he donated and you know, just packed up everything, all the clothes. He said, I just don't need it. I live in this 2000 square foot apartment in or condo in Hawaii. And I don't, I've been living without this stuff for now right. several years. I just don't need it. And he never went back and looked at any of it. So he didn't yeah. give away all of his possessions, <laughs> right. but he gave away all the ones in that, in that, and it was more than an office. It was a town home. So it, you right. know, it was, it was still <laughs> symbolic to him. Yeah, it was, it was a, symbolic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, and, and I just love those little stories that you hear about him. Uh, it, it's so interesting. The, the, the reason that he inspired me the most, I remember it was a, as a blog, I think he asked the question, how can I be of service um, in order to get what I desire? And you even write about it in the book, how yeah. there's a point where between your mother and father, um, they were struggling a little bit. And then he had really committed to service. And it, it was at that point, everything seemed to to switch around. You have a chapter on that. And I, right. I wanted to get your perspective of, on service and how, what he taught you and what you would say about the importance of service in, in your life. Yeah. I mean, uh, I could hear him saying it right now. When you say to the universe, how may I serve the universe says to you, how may I serve you back? You know, but if you go to the universe and say, give me, give me, give me, mm -hmm. then you're going to hear that back in your life. And that, um, not only that, but, you know, I remember him talking about this uh, experiment that was done where they looked at acts of kindness. So they had somebody. Uh, so anyway, the findings of the experiment were basically that when you d do an act of kindness towards somebody, your uh, dopamine and serotonin levels in your brain, the things that make you feel good are elevated to the same degree that the person receiving the act of kindness is 
are elevated. So you benefit. There's just like, it, it feels good to serve others. And the coolest part about that experiment was that somebody who observed the act of kindness just observed it, but had took no part in it. They experienced that elevated, heightened sense of feeling good uh, that comes from serving others. And I think that we get caught up in our lives of like, I need to get this done. I need to be here. I don't have time, you know, but when you do take the time, I, not that long ago, there was a woman in front of me at a juice. I was in, I live in New York, a, a juice press. She had picked out like three things to buy. And then she realized she forgot her wallet. And I said, I'll buy them for you. Cause I could tell she was disappointed, you know? And, um, and this is, I watched my parents do stuff like this my whole life. This is not to toot my own horn. Right, it was right. just, it just seemed like the right thing to do. She really wanted these things. She forgot her wallet. She started crying and uh, said, you have no idea. I, I'm working with a therapist and she keeps telling me I need to learn how to receive gifts from people that I don't know how to allow people to serve me. And here you are and you show up and you're willing to buy these for me and you don't even know me. And then the, the cash register, or the person working the cash register was visibly moved too. And it was just a beautiful moment for all three of us. And it cost me, you know, $15 or something. And it was it was just a, a reminder for me because my mom and dad always did stuff like that. If they saw an opportunity to help and my mom still, they stepped in and helped. And um, I can remember my mom buying people's groceries in lines, hearing a woman, uh, seeing a woman paying with food stamps and seeing that she was pregnant. So getting her address and dropping off all of her uh, baby stuff, you know, I have seven siblings. So she had a lot of baby stuff, dropping it all off at her house and buying diapers for her and uh, my dad loved to do that stuff too. There was a, there was a woman on the news um, who had been, I forget her name, but she was in jail. She got arrested because she had an unpaid parking ticket. And this was a woman who lived in Alabama. She didn't have a lot of money. She had an unpaid parking ticket that had uh, amassed so much interest and penalties that they came and arrested her and put her in jail. So now she's the caretaker to her child. She's in jail, her child, just over a parking ticket. You know, her child's in my dad heard this story and he called up the county and said, I want to pay this woman's oh, fines, wow. you know, and this story aired on national television. He's the only person who called up and did that. And there are people who are willing to do it. Just, you just have to start thinking that way. Right. And it feels so good because this woman said, I need to find out who did that for me. And she calls him and, and they became friends and it was just, a beautiful thing and I'm so blessed to have been raised by parents like that because um I try to remember to be like that to invite that kind of service into my life because when you take care of people people take care of you you know I just this, this short question what I, I want to know what it was like to, to the people around he, he had so many like famous friends and interesting yeah. people that would contact him hey dad Ram Das is on the phone or Deepak yeah. Chopra is on the phone dad I mean what was that like to also have all these amazing people um that came that were his friends yeah. as well I mean growing up I don't <laughs> think I realized how cool that was um I remember, yeah, I mean, we, I remember having dinner with Deepak and coming over. I had dinner with Ram Dass and my dad when I was like maybe 20, but I still didn't even realize. Didn't know, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was cool <laughs> and Ram Dass gave me a copy of his book and he signed it, but it didn't hit me until after he passed away. And I was only 25 when he passed away. So I also think that we, as we get older, we just become more interested in spirituality. Either you lose somebody or you start to get close to that point in your own life where you've got to wonder, you know, what else, is this it? What else is right. out there? How can I tap into it? One of the things you talk about in the book, and I, I think really the crux of Wayne Dyer's life, if you read all of his books, was forgiveness. He had, he had this sort of anger and hatred in his life. And it really it was it, it awakened him when he when he forgave and let go of this deep seated resentment that he for held. his father yeah and and right for his father so um and I and, and I could tell that 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 resonated with you and you even give examples in your own life so I right. wanted to know tell me a little bit more about how how hit those teachings changed you yeah I'll I'll tell you even a, a broader story that encompasses that. Um, so my dad was really into numbers when he was alive and synchronicity mm -hmm. through numbers and all he, he loved the number 18. My mom was into this too. So 
I grew up with parents like that. They were always just looking for <laughs> symbolism through numbers. Like right. if they're looking at houses, oh, this one adds up to 18 and that one doesn't. <laughs> so we should go, you know, things like that. So when my dad passed away, um, I felt like, you know, he died on August 30th. And I felt like if everything he taught was true, that he would pick a meaningful day to pass away, that there had to be some kind of meaning behind when he chose to leave. And I was uh, sort of determined to figure it out. And, and the numbers didn't really add up to anything that meant a lot to me um, mm -hmm. or to him. So I couldn't at first figure it out, but I started to read his book, I Can See Clearly Now. And in there's a chapter in there where he talks about his relationship with his father and everything that happened there, which was basically that, you know, his father walked out when he was just a baby. He had two mm -hmm. older brothers. This was in the forties. Um, so he left his three sons and his wife his my my grandmother my dad's mother could not make enough money to support her three sons so my brother my dad and his uh, brother ended up in foster care and she was able to care for one of them and orphanages and all that so um as my dad got older he my, my grandma eventually got her family back together by the way but it took her several years and uh so as my dad got older he just started to really resent this man who left his mother and he was still alive at that time. So my dad wanted to find him, uh, to find his father and to give him a piece of his mind and, and to ask him like, how do, do you, my dad always said, he just wanted to know, do you think about your son, Wayne and your other two sons? Do you, do you acknowledge that we exist, you know, or have you just really blocked us out? And, um, so he searched for him for years. I mean, into his twenties and he was filled with rage towards this man that, uh, he said he would have nightmares about beating him up, finding him, screaming at him, you know, things that didn't don't make you feel good. And he was holding on to this hatred uh, for this man who was his father. He eventually found out that he had died um, actually like a couple years prior, even though he had still been searching for him. And through a series of um, really crazy coincidences that I, I will probably get them wrong, but he writes about them and I can see clearly now. So I read them. My dad was able to find his grave in Biloxi, Mississippi. And he went down there and he went to the grave with this um, intention of pissing on his father's grave and finally giving his father, you know, this, a piece of his mind. And um, he got to the grave, he found it, he went there. And he did that at first. He, he did the yelling and the screaming and the anger. And uh, after he did that for a little while, he went to leave because that's what he came there to do. And as he walked back to his car, he said he just felt this overwhelming sense of love and uh, a need, an urging to go back and, and go back to his father's grave that, that he wasn't done. So he listened to that inner feeling the knowing that's kind of what the theme of our book is he listened to that inner voice mm -hmm. he went back to his father's grave and he just felt compelled to forgive him and he said out loud you know from this day forward I no longer uh, carry any negative feelings for you I send you love and I forgive you and he professed this love for his father and he cried and he had this healing moment and uh from that day forward, his whole life changed. That's when his career took off. He got out of a relationship he wasn't happy in. Anyway, the day that that was, the date was August 30th. Oh, wow. 19, <laughs> yeah, 70 something, whatever year it was, I don't know, but it was August 30th. And he writes in his own words in his book, I can see clearly now, if you were to ask me what the most significant events of my life were, I would say the events that took place on August 30th. And I read that and I thought, I found it, you know, and I sent it to my whole family. And, but what I really took from it was that, um, cause this was in the first couple of weeks of my dad passing away. I felt compelled to read this book because I was there when my dad wrote a lot of it and mm -hmm. he was so compelled to write it. And we kept asking him, but why are you writing a memoir? You're only, he was like 73 when he wrote it. We said, you're going to have to write another one in 10 years, you know, or 15 mm -hmm. years. And he said, I don't know, I just am feeling called to write this book. So I'm writing it. And so I wanted to read that one. And what I took from learning that, uh, that he died on August 30th, and that it was also the most significant day in his life, because it's when he forgave his father and his relationship with his father completely changed to take on a whole new meaning. And then his life changed. 
I felt like what he was saying to his children and to me was that August 30th does not mark the day that your relationship with your father ends. It marks the day that it changes to take on a whole new meaning, just like it did for him in his life with his father. And wow. um, yeah, and it was a really symbolic moment for me. It was one of those moments that, like I said, when I became open to the signs and the miracles, that's the kind of stuff I started to tune into and, and be open to just seeing how it's all in perfect divine order. It's not for me to question. You know, we, we come here on time. We always celebrate the birth of a baby. Nobody questions the birth of a baby. We love our birthdays. We celebrate them every year for our whole lives. And then the day we're called back, tends to be a day that we all fear for ourselves, for loved ones. And um, I, what my dad taught was to embrace that day as well, same way that you do your birthday mm -hmm. and that it's just a return home. It's, you know, we have a round trip ticket. Don't fear something that's inevitable. Embrace it if you right. can while you're alive, you know, and the, your life will be enriched because of that. And it's hard to do uh, because True. it is scary and it is final and it's, Nobody wants to lose somebody they love. It's, you know, it's heartbreaking. But at the same time that it's heartbreaking, it can be eye-opening. It can be heart-opening. I mean, I felt like those early weeks, days, months after my dad passed away were some of the most compassionate days of my life. Mm -hmm. Compassion towards other people because I was heartbroken and I felt more open to other people's heartbreak, you know? Um, so there's always gifts wrapped uh, hidden wrapped up differently than we expect them and yeah True. i would have to say your, your dad taught me how to meditate you know he was such a great meditator and he yeah. he was great at writing about meditating and inspiring people to meditate and yeah. you know so so i want to know you know as somebody behind the scenes how often did your dad meditate um what was, was it in the morning at night it was a little bit every day what was your perspective watching your dad, this great teacher of meditation, as to how he personally did it? He definitely did meditate every day. But one thing I'll have to say is my mom is the one who got him into meditation. You know, ah. she, yeah, she has been an avid meditator since she was just 12 or 13 years old. She discovered it. She became, um, I don't want to say addicted to it, but just uh, she needed it every day, you know, mm -hmm. and she was so committed to her meditation practice my whole childhood and still today. She always stops in the afternoon, meditates for 20, 30 minutes. And my dad, um, and she does it the same way in silence. She says, that's all you need. You don't need a recording. You don't need anything. Mm -hmm. My dad liked, uh, he was different than her. He liked to try different forms of meditation. He would do different recordings. Um, the last one that he was doing before he passed away, when we were in Australia, we were staying in hotels and a lot of our hotel rooms, we had conjoining rooms. He would come in in the morning and wake me and my sister Sky up and say, okay, it's time to meditate. And he would play this meditation that was a man. It was just a YouTube video, but he would repeat the words, I am not the body. I am not even the mind uh, for like 15 guru. minutes. Yeah. yeah. And then he would do an ohm a series of ohms and mm -hmm. um so we were doing that with him that that's the one he was into at the end of his life but he you know uh, the moses code meditation have you mm -hmm. heard of that one yeah yeah that's when he taught me to meditate was when he started doing that one i think i was like 19 or 20 um and i started to get into it so yeah he definitely meditated every day usually in the morning but uh when we were doing the moses code he would do it twice a day because that's what you were supposed to do so morning and right. afternoon and it's, it's definitely life-changing. I mean, when I, I'm not always disciplined in a meditation practice, but when I am, and when I uh, really make it a priority, I find that I am way more tuned into not only my inner knowing, my intuition, but also to my dad and to just um, being able to view my problems, my life from more of a bird's eye observer perspective than someone who gets so caught up in all the little things so it has right. a lot of benefits for me one of my favorite things about your dad was he had the most remarkable voice he, he had yeah. the most amazing it, it as somebody that reads a lot and has done odd uh, you know audiobooks it, it just it, it, it it's very i could hear it in a room of million people if i heard your dad's voice i would instantly be able to pick it out 
And right. so I don't, I, I, it's not really a question, but um, is, is that you could too, I'm sure as, as the daughter, but yeah. it's, it's just so amazing. And probably yeah. um, you can hear it all the time when he, when he's yeah, speaking he had, to you, it's very, very distinct, right? Distinct. Yes, it is. And, and <laughs> I also felt so blessed after he passed, cause it's true. His voice was, um, it was, it was so distinct and it was so comforting. He had a way of speaking that, you know, uh, if you would ask me my favorite speaker, it's my dad because mm -hmm. not because he's, I mean, because he's my dad, but also because he just could draw you in. Even if it was a topic you weren't interested in, he could draw you and he made everything interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt so lucky when I realized after he passed away that I had hours upon hours upon hours of recordings of him that I could go listen wow. to whenever I wanted. And not was, everybody has that. when they. It, lose it felt so like it was, it was a personal thing. Like whenever he's yeah. talking, it was talking to me. That it right. was the, some, the way he did it. it yeah, really he had an ability to to do that. I think that's why he touched so many people's lives. You know, right. another thing that he taught was intention and the power of intention. And uh, you know, uh, in that in that book taught me a lot about you know, how to take action, the the proper ways of thinking. Uh, I wanted to know how that resonated with you and your knowing his teachings of intention. Yeah, so actually something that uh, that taps on something we talked about earlier, when my dad wrote the book, The Power of Intention, it was during what he called the biggest storm of his life. And that was when my parents were divorcing. Mm -hmm. um, I was 11 years old. I was with him in Maui and my they were going to get a divorce and they, they were not speaking. They had attorneys. They were fighting. It was very ugly. And my dad was... Um, he, he said he was in a depression, something that he prior to that didn't even necessarily, uh, yeah, and into a depression. And uh, that was something that he didn't even necessarily before that believe, he didn't believe in the word depression and he found himself in one. And uh, so when, when he was in the biggest storm of his life, he wrote this book, The Power of Intention. And, and it became, aside from his first book, Euronia Zones, uh, it was his best-selling book of of his life, and it was such an example of using your suffering to serve, because that's the only place he could channel his energy. He was unhappy in his life with my mom, and um, really struggling in his personal life. So he he channeled all of his energy into this book, which was the power of intention. And um, I've listened to it on audiobook so many times. I mean, I was young when he wrote it, but um, mm -hmm. I. I, it's, you know, what is your intention behind your actions at all times? You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, but anyway, where, where I was going to go with that was that my, my parents ended up, um, not getting a divorce after, after having probably a year of a really ugly battle and spending all this money on attorneys and all of that. And they, they didn't get back together, but they just stayed married and they had other relationships and, and loved other people. And, they still, they found a way to love each other and to dissolve um, all of the ugliness through the power of love. And it was through changing their intention. It was, you know, my dad discovered this work about intention mm -hmm. during this time, and he was able to apply it to his own storm and it got them out of it. You know, they, they agreed. They said, we don't need attorneys. We, we are adults. We love each other. We have spent this many years uh, together as a, as a family. We have all these kids let's just be adults here and figure this out ourselves. And, and that's that intention and stemming from love dissolved the whole problem. And they stayed friends and best of friends till the day he died. I mean, they spoke on the phone daily. We still took family vacations together. It was such an example to, to us as his kids, to me, mm -hmm. to see that, you know, you don't have to let these rules about society dictate your life. If you want to be married to someone and still see other people, you can do that. And you can still take family vacations together. And there, there are no rules, you know, that none of us have to ascribe to, um, to a set of rules or values. It's your own personal choice. And it was through the power of intention and the power of love that they got to that place. Right. So what would you say, uh, what was the teaching that a lot of people don't talk about the one that you wish more people would mention or uh, when people discuss Wayne Dyer's teachings, what's the one thing you wish more people um, were aware of that he taught? 
Um, I don't know because everyone, yeah. So um, it's hard to say one teaching because I know that different people have read different books and they have their different favorites and all of that. But one that I discovered recently that I hadn't heard uh, him say while he was alive and I heard it in, a, in one of his podcasts was um, he was talking about having happiness and joy for other people, not just for yourself. And he gave this example of when he would play uh, tennis, he was an avid tennis player when he was younger. Mm -hmm. And he would, he said that, you know, sometimes you're playing tennis and you get into this groove where every ball goes perfectly your way. You know, it stays in bounds by this much. And, um, you know, you're just, you're in a groove and it doesn't matter what your opponent does. You're hitting all the points. And we see this when we watch sports, you know, one team, a basketball team, all of a sudden just gets in the groove and they're hitting every shot These that, you know, they're falling on the ground and still making the basket. And it's like, you tap into this energy and you become unstoppable. And he said that when you're in that groove, it feels so good. And you, you know, you feel invincible then when you're, and, and this is a metaphor for in life too, but mm -hmm. so then in his tennis matches, when there would be times where his opponent would get into that groove and be so tapped in and uh, hitting every shot. And he'd be sure that one's going to go out of bounds. And then it, you know, it stays in by a centimeter. And um, he said that that feels crappy. <laughs> you know, you're like, Oh, you're getting frustrated. My opponent keeps hitting all these shots. And I, you know, how is he getting so lucky? All that. And he said, what he found was that in those moments when, um, when, when his opponent would be in the group, if he could find it in himself to have pure authentic joy for his partner, for his opponent in those moments and be excited for him that he was feeling so good and so in the group that he would get back into that group. You know, that, that joy for somebody else pushed ah. him back into the place that he was longing for, that he was seeking. And then they would play these incredible tennis matches that other people would be watching. Oh my God, look at that. You know, and then they're playing the best tennis of his life, both of them. And it's, right. and it's just fun and joy for everyone. So I've taken that into my own life to, you know, when I'm feeling down and sometimes you don't feel like you can get out of it. It doesn't matter if you listen mm -hmm. to something spiritual or if you tell yourself to change your thoughts, sometimes I just can't do it. And I think we all can relate to that um, where you're just kind of stuck and you're down. The one thing that I have found that can work is finding something to get excited about for somebody else, you know, and it can just elevate your energy that just a little bit to start you on a, uh, it's like a chain reaction, you know, then you, you feel a little bit of joy and it keeps going. And that that's one that um, I heard recently, I, I, we wrote about it in the books, so I, I heard it a little while ago, but I really tried to integrate it into my life because I think it's easy to when you're feeling good to feel good, but it's when you're not feeling good, what do you right. do then? You know, and that's, that's been a tool for me. So uh, I also wanted to talk about, you finally started to hear your dad in dreams. It's something that happened to me. It was, a you know, in a dream, my dad's back to his youngest perfect self and he's talking to me. And so I wanted to, to relate that you, you had your experience where you started to hear and see your dad in dreams, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had one dream that was just like, you know, it blew me away. I was uh, in my bed and I was sleeping and, and we lived in a studio at that point. And um, I'm, I'm asleep. I'm actually asleep. And then my alarm went off in real life and it woke me up and I hit snooze and I was like, okay, I'm going to sleep for 10 more minutes. I immediately fell back asleep. And, but in my dream, I was doing exactly what I was doing in real life. I was laying in my bed in um, my apartment and I was looking at my phone and then my, I hear my door opening and I look up and it's my dad walking into my apartment. And, um, I jumped out of my bed and I ran over to him and I said, I know that I'm asleep, but this isn't a dream. This is real. And he said, yeah, this is real. I'm really here. And I said, <laughs> I got skeptical and I said, okay, but if you're really here, then I could touch you. And he said, so touch me. And in my, in my dream, I grabbed his arms and I could feel his hairy, warm, fleshy arms. And, um, and in that moment I dropped the skepticism and I hugged him and we talked and it was so real. Uh, and then my alarm went back off and, and I opened my eyes and I thought that's, that it was not a dream. That was real. He was just here. I just shifted into another dimension, you know? And I had, I spoke to a, a friend who's a, a psychic medium and she told mm -hmm. me that 
without knowing that dream, she said, you know, if, if you're, if it's lucid dreaming and if, and if there's any kind of touching acknowledgement of touching or invitation to touch, that's when, you know, it's a real visitation. And I was like, Oh my God, I've just had this dream and I've been telling everyone about it. So I think that for me, that was confirmation. I don't know that she knows that that's, you know, the only way visitations happen, but it was cool for me. And I also, she is also, her name's Karen Noe. Um, she told me to pay attention to your thoughts because, you know, our, our thoughts are going a mile a minute most of the time, mm -hmm. but every once in a while, a thought might pop in where it says like, hi, honey, you know, or something like that. I thought that stops that starts that way. You wouldn't talk to yourself that way. You know, you wouldn't call yourself honey or, right. and um, so I started to tune into that and I felt like I was hearing my dad communicating with me in my mind. And I still do like it, random, a joke will pop into my mind that he used to say, where did that come from? You know? <laughs> right. um, and, and I'll hear it in his voice. It, it's very cool. Once you become open to it, um, right. I think that's just the first step being open to it and asking, ask your loved ones, ask the universe for signs and communication and you'll start to receive them. Sage, I want to thank you so much for coming on and getting a chance to meet you and yeah. to talk about your book and your dad. Are, are we going to get another book soon? Are you gonna, are you, you're, there's not so writing much one at the about. moment, but okay. <laughs> yes, hopefully then, I mean, I just had a baby, he's two months old and well, then congratulations. I have old, That's so. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So, but yes, in a, in a little bit, I think we will pick it, pick up the pen again and thank get you. going. Yeah. Because uh, the book really expanded and synthesized all those different teachings he had into one book. And for a lot of people that haven't had access to Wayne Dyer, Go read The Knowing. It's a great place to start and get a background where you want to start. There's so much amazing stuff. I just oh, want to thank, thank you. you so much for coming on and um, look forward to talking to you again soon. And I'll be excited to pick up your next book. Oh, thank you so much.